Hello everyone, my name is Azrak Shamia and I'm excited to be part of this process for the selection of the public art project celebrating the centennial anniversary of the 19th Amendment and Cambridge Women's Suffrage. My project is titled The Future to be Rewritten. It is a landscape installation offering a dignified space for gathering and a quiet contemplation about women's suffrage in the United States reflecting on the past, present, and the future of voting rights, social justice, and democracy. In this presentation, I will first outline the background and concept for the project, describe its location and materials, and will then go on to discuss the experience of visitors on site. In the end, I will show how this project engages the role of art and monuments in public space, and end with some examples of content inscribed in the piece. We demand the amendment to the United States Constitution in franchising women, reads the text at the silk applique banner displayed on the side of a wagon that traveled with the suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. on the 3rd of March, 1913, when 5,000 women marched to demand their right to vote. This banner succinctly summarizes their political great demand, the very change to the Constitution. Reminiscent of the recent protests across America, the parade of 1913 ended in a huge riot in which many of the marching women and bystanders were injured. Yet only a few years later, in 1920, the words from this protest banner became a reality. August 18 this year will mark the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, a significant milestone in the decade-long struggle for women's rights and equal responsibilities of citizenship. This project aims to acknowledge the contribution of Cambridge women to this long struggle, celebrating the power and the commitment of the many passionate individuals from our city who dedicated their life to the pursuit of justice and equality, changing the world they live in. Art provides a tangible medium to remember their names, to highlight their thoughts and actions, to show how great ideas can actually lead to change. It also provides a medium to inspire a more nuanced understanding of history in order to inform our present and create a better future. Many of the slogans from the suffrage campaigns resonate with the ongoing struggle for full enfranchisement today. In this monument, it is thus important that the contribution of Cambridge women are contextualized both with the history of the suffrage movement and the history of American citizenship, while providing a link to the ongoing and future concerns of social justice and democracy. The project thus aims to do that by highlighting the many voices that have been left out and are still silenced, unheard, or forgotten. These ideas translate into a landscape that offers a dignified space for gathering and quiet contemplation. The project takes the form of a three-dimensional palimpsest rendered visible through an arrangement of vertical and horizontal concrete elements inscribed with names of Cambridge suffragettes and quotes from political and feminist activists and thinkers that will be curated through a participatory process. The visual inspiration for this concept is the palimpsest, which refers to ancient manuscript pages whose original content was scraped off to make space for new text. While pages of the ancient palimpsests were overwritten due to material scarcity, the notion of writing and rewriting history in this project is deployed as a conceptual tool. If we are to secure the future voting rights, social justice and democracy for all, the future history needs to be written and rewritten to include the perspectives of those who have been left out. Another visual inspiration for this project is cross-writing, as exemplified in this handwritten letter from the 19th century, which contains two separate sets of writing, one written perpendicularly over the other. 
This was done during the early days of the postal system in the 19th century to save on expensive postage charges as well to save paper. In this project, however, the notion of cross-writing becomes an aesthetic medium to showcase the complexities and contradictions of the suffrage movement in the United States, to link the past, present and future, and to enable the viewer to ask critical questions and form their own opinions. The cross-writing links the past, present and future, putting them direct link in conversation with each other. The viewer sees two or more distinct phrases at once, which sets them in a meaning-making relation to each other when they are otherwise not necessarily thought of as complementary. It's about setting up dialogues across history that resists a one-sided and linear reading, which is how the complexities and contradictions of individual events and moments in time can be revealed in a more nuanced way, or at least be open to critical interpretation. The installation is located in the northeast corner of the Cambridge Common, along the pathway that connects the Civil War Memorial Plaza with the Mass Avenue towards Porta Square. The overall size of the landscape intervention is 77.5 by 38 feet. The structure is based on a single element, a prismatic form, which is repeated vertically and horizontally in varied locations and sizes. These prismatic elements are made of semi-polished exposed concrete. Their purple shade is created by adding pigment to the liquid concrete. This material is not only smooth to the touch, but it is also weathering beautifully, similar to the exposed concrete at the Alta Cemetery in Austria, shown in this slide. The pigmenting concrete allows for a more natural appearance of the material, embracing its natural inconsistencies and varied complexions in different weather conditions. The concrete elements are partially clad in highly polished stainless steel sheets which cover one or two sides of each prism. The mirror finish is chosen for its reflectivity and immersive attributes, as well as for its durability in outdoor conditions. Finally, long strips of brass, laser cut with text, are attached to the concrete elements. This material is chosen for its gold-like appearance and durability. The color scheme alludes to the American suffrage colors, the white, purple, and gold, which stood for purity, loyalty, and purpose, respectively. Depending on the time of the day and the angle of viewing, the highly polished stainless steel can have a mirroring effect. As the stainless steel wraps over the concrete elements, the installation symbolically merges with the surrounding landscape and the passers-by. The artwork incites curiosity, engaging the visitor in a dynamic experience of space. Depending on the point of view, the story of the installation is activated through different visual clues. There are three main scenarios created through the visitor's perspective on the landscape. The first image is rendered visible when taking a walk from Porta Square in the direction of Civil War Memorial Plaza. The viewers encounter a gridded array of vertical pillars clad in a shiny stainless steel, which evokes the image of a suffrage march. By walking on the path, they symbolically become part of this march as they witness their own bodies reflected back at them in the monument. Walking through the installation, the viewer is surrounded by an array of vertical and horizontal text strips, inviting cross-reading of selected names and quotes. The last pillar in the southeast corner of the installation contains an interactive component, a periscope an instrument that allows for observing the installation and its surrounding from a higher point of view. Similar to the observation periscopes in submarines, a visitor can wind the crank handle on the periscope to look at the neighboring male monuments. 
This symbolically elevates the women and children so that they can come eye to eye level with the statues that are otherwise only seen from below as they are placed on pedestals and quite literally situates the women celebrated in this monument in conversation with all of the men already memorialized in the common. The same device can be used to view the installation from above. The top view reveals the abstract image of a jail door inspired by jailed for freedom pins given by the National Women's Party to women who were imprisoned for their political activism. For example, more than 90 silent sentinels were imprisoned in 1917 following a silent vigil outside of the White House held to um, raise awareness for women's suffrage. They were arrested on the charges of obstructing traffic and were sent to prison in Washington, D.C. and in Virginia. The symbolism of the jail door is chosen to remember the brutality and violence endured by the suffragettes. While imprisoned, they suffered severe beatings and humiliations. Those in hunger strikes were force-fed. The publicity of their mistreatments contributed to the changing opinions of the public and the Congress about women's suffrage. While the same vertical element is repeated across the installation, aesthetic variation is achieved through diversity of prism heights. Based on human scales, the height of vertical elements range between 6.5 to 5 feet. Half foot width remains consistent throughout the installation. Similarly, the height of the horizontal bench-like elements ranges from circa 2.8 to 1.4 feet. Additional features could include subtle night illuminations with LED lamps integrated into the bottom of the prisms. Depending on whether there is a possibility for the city to provide gardening and landscaping, the top of the horizontal prisms could be partially finished as a planter filled with yellow roses. Climbing yellow roses could be planted along the vertical prisms too. A rose garden in the park would add an additional symbolic dimension to the project as yellow flowers and rose-shaped pins with votes for women slogans were frequently worn by pro-suffrage groups to indicate their political alliance and solidarity. In relation to the role of monuments in public space, this project takes a specific discursive position that moves away from the figural and literal representation of historical figures. Indebted to the legacy of minimalism, this non-representational artwork is more aligned with the abstract symbolism of Maya Lin's Vietnam War Memorial uh, than Boston Women's Memorial by Meredith Bergman. Maya Lin's War Memorial utilizes the mirroring effect of the polishing black granite and text listing 57,000 names. This monument became the paradigm of American monument building. Lynn's novel and influential design from the 1980 stripped the glory away from the battle, recreating the emotional effect of a sea of graves in the form of a list. The list of names. This type of representation allowed her, as an art historian Daniel Abramson notes, to invent a new type of monumental representation of history, one without narrativity and moralizing. This project is also inspired by other notable contemporary monuments that successfully tackle complicated and contested histories through non-representational form. For example, the National Memorial to Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, a mass design group, commemorates the victims of lynching in the United States. The notion of lynching is powerfully alluded with 805 hanging steel rectangles, which have the size and the shape of coffins. The names and dates of the victims are documented on the steel panels. Another reference for this project is the Stolpersteine project in Berlin, Germany, by Gunther Demnig, which commemorates people who are persecuted by Nazis between 1933 and 1945. 
This is an ongoing participatory project that represents a form of palimpsests on urban scale. Citizens are invited to participate by replacing the existing paving stones of the city with stones that carry brass inscriptions of those who were killed. Stolperstein literally means a stumbling stone and metaphorically a stumbling block. And this points at the need to continuously reflect on what has been erased from history. As citizens are also asked to help take care of these stones among their community, art becomes a tool for safekeeping democracy, peace and community. My proposed project also builds on my own body of work in public space concerned with political expression, engaged citizenship and shared experiences. Over the past five years, I have been working with my Future Heritage Lab at MIT on projects that probe how art can be a form of opposing a global system in which the massive environmental cost of the capitalist-driven consumer lifestyle are increasingly borne by those who are the most excluded from that lifestyle. My work often addresses the loss of empathy in consumer societies and the increasing indifference to the suffering of others. For example, the Memory Matrix project, which depicts fragments of the Palmyra Arch and questions the ethics of cultural preservation and humanitarian aid in the time of war. What does it mean to mourn the destruction of Palmyra's ruins while millions of Syrians are being killed and confined to refugee camps? How does one approach the restoration of purposefully destroyed cultural heritage without perpetuating the colonial dynamics? This project was initiated at MIT and installed at the campus in 2016. The 20,000 small laser cut pixels were cut with holes outlining heritage destroyed during our lifetime. These outlines were created by over 700 project participants in various locations who were invited to empathize with Syrians by relating the loss of their own heritage to the cultural destruction in Syria. This collaborative and participatory approach in my work would also be part of this project for the Cambridge Common. The names and quotes would be only partially curated by myself in collaboration with the stakeholders of the Public Art Commission. The majority of names and quotes, however, would be determined through a co-curation process, providing an opportunity to engage with the broader Cambridge community and to include a multitude of perspectives, for example, from members of various communities, including queer, trans, black, indigenous and people of color, as well as youth. Rather than speaking on behalf of Cambridge community members, the project would provide the armature that gets filled with their diverse perspectives. The intention for integrating names and quotes into the installation is to provide a way into the history of suffrage and its legacy that remains relevant to ongoing issues surrounding the struggle for social justice in, in this country. The quotes exemplify the categories that are significant in engaging both the past and the present. Marie Louise Baldwin, for example, is a significant figure in Cambridge history. She was a celebrated educator and advocate for women's rights and the first black woman to be appointed school principal in Massachusetts. As the head of Agassiz School for 40 years, him, her impact on the minds of young Cambridgians is inarguable. Students at the school campaigned to have the school renamed in honor of Baldwin, and in 2002, the Louis Agassiz School was renamed the Maria L. Baldwin School. Her words still ring true today, and I quote, anything is possible as long as you are true to yourself and never give up, even when the world seems to say stop. Similarly, slogans from the suffrage movement banners from over a century ago, such as not privilege, but justice, are nearly identical to the slogans chanted at today's Black Lives Matter and women marches across the world. Banners with suffragist slogans were carried in marches across the country. The intertwining of local Cambridge quotes with banners from around the United States 
shows the exchange of ideas between suffragists at the local and national level through newsletters, conventions, banners, and posters. Both of these quotes remain valid and relevant statements to the current issues in women's rights and social justice. With the inclusion of quotes in the monument, there is also an opportunity to include previously excluded voices, the words of black women, such as the Combahee River Collective, and indigenous women, Zitkala Shah, that speak to a history of women's suffrage that was complex and messy by nature. As important as celebrating an achievement of one marginalized group, it is also the acknowledgement of its contradictions and failures, the voices omitted from the accepted historical narrative, the ones that complicate the achievement and prompt a critical reflection on the tendency to smooth over complex and contradictory messages for the sake of our collective desire to believe that progress is an all-encompassing good. The 15th Amendment, granting black men the right to vote, was ostensibly a moot point for the century following its, its ratification in 1870. Black Americans, regardless of gender, were effectively disenfranchised through the use of poll taxes, literacy tests, and other means of voter suppression until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It wasn't until 1924 that Native Americans were granted citizenship in the United States and thereby the right to vote, regardless of tribal affiliation, through the Indian Citizenship Act. This quote from female Yankton Dakota Sioux political activist Zitkala Shah, uh, cross-read with the constitutional amendment, illuminates the complicated history of suffrage for other marginalized groups. It was not only women struggling to advocate for what should have been a basic uh, right for all set citizens and for the validity of their citizenship to be universally acknowledged. When thinking about the history of the United States and the suffrage movement, it is impossible to ignore the varying views held by activists by literally intersecting quotes that may be at odds with each other, or that encompass groups we might not necessarily imagine in conversation. The cross-writing and cross-reading of quotes on the artwork shows the need for an intersectional analysis of, of history. The conversations held in these crossed selections include one between Marsha P. Johnson, a transgender woman, who was pivotal in the movement of LGBTQ rights, and Sarah Grimke, a vocal suffragist who stopped speaking in public at the request of her husband after years of activism. This pairing highlights the oppression that civil rights activists have been subjected to over 100 years. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a major proponent of women's suffrage was also one of the most outspoken racist in the movement and she did not support black women voting. Crossing her quote with a quote from the local black feminist Combahee River Collective creates a space for viewers to think about the history of racism in the feminist movement. Poets have long used their voices to support civil rights movements. The pairing of Harlem Renaissance luminary Langston Hume and contemporary poet Julia Alvarez highlights an exclusion of non-white perspectives from cultural memory that persists to this day. Hume wrote his poems in the 1920s describing the black experience in America. The poem quoted, I too, was written in response to Walt Whitman 1860 work, I Hear America Singing. 70 years later, Dominican-American author Julia Alvarez's poem, I Too, Sing America, was written, joining in the conversation with Whitman and Hume. The repetition of this phrase in both English and Spanish evokes to emphasize and exemplify the myriad of voices omitted in the recordings of much of history, be they black, Hispanic, female, or other. 
I thank you for your attention and consideration of this proposal for the Cambridge Common. Many thanks to the City of Cambridge for inviting me to be part of this process and special thanks to my wonderful team, family members, friends and collaborators who helped me develop this proposal. I look forward to hear your opinions and engage in upcoming discussions.